And then I would welcome the next speaker in that case, uh, which is um, Jamie Verbeke from uh, Leuven uh, KU or Katholieke Universiteit. Yeah. And um, so, yes, Demi, that's great. You're sharing your screen. And uh, so uh, let me say just two things about Demi, uh, who is both, both librarian and, uh, and associate professor uh, at the Faculty of Arts. Um, so um, you're responsible for the collections and services for the arts and humanities and member of the management team of the um, primary responsibilities for research contributing to strategic development and operational management at KU Leuven Libraries. And you are combining this position in the library with an appointment as associate professor. You may add things to that, Demi. I know you have many uh, hats at the moment. And uh, your research and teaching primarily focus on nonprofit and community driven forms of scholarly communication in the humanities. So, welcome uh, to Demi, and please feel free to add also if you're doing other things at the moment. <laughs> Thank you Thank very you. much. The, the only thing that I wanted to add is like it's a very Belgian solution. We are Kai Leuven and the Kai used to stand for Catholic, but now it doesn't stand for anything anymore. If you want to believe it stands for Catholic, Catholic, it's fine, but you don't have to. It's a typical Belgian solution. <laughs> but so I'm here to talk about transformative agreements, the good, the bad and the beautiful. And because I did not want to insult any gender for the beautiful, I took a picture of my dog, Elvis. I hope that's OK. But first, actually, the question is, what do we mean when we talk about transformative agreements? And in essence, what is a transformative agreement? It's a contract between an academic institution and a publisher intended to transform the model of publishing behind a paywall to an open access model. And in most cases, they're also called transitional agreements to indicate that these are, these are temporary arrangements to support the transition from one method of scholarly communication to the other. And so, as was said actually by the previous speaker, transformative agreements typically are based on the conviction that there's enough money in the system, that the current level of investment is sufficient to fund the transformation to open access within existing publishing structures. And so the basic idea is you maintain the present level of funding, but you invest it in production costs rather than in the finished product. And if we uh, trans, uh, translate that to the realities, the everyday realities, basically that means to invest the acquisition budgets of libraries into open access publishing, because that is where the current, where, where the, the money comes from that is in the system through subscriptions. So in theory, actually transformative agreements is any kind of agreement that leads to a transformation. In reality, what most people mean, what, what most of our transformative agreements actually are, or read and publish deals, where you have a contract that uh, has the reading part, the former subscription part, combined with a publishing part. So uh, members of an institution, uh, because of these contracts, can read the content in typically journals of that publisher and can actually also publish in open access in these journals, not really for free because it's part of the contract. Um, by the way, Plan S has a very specific and detailed definition of what they consider to be a transformative journal, but that's a paper in itself, like it's about to do with the number of articles in a journal that are open access and the evolution there. Yeah. And so, what is the good about these things? Why would we want to have read and publish deals? It is very clear if you have a read and publish deal that more journal articles will be placed in open access. Studies have shown that we have read and published agreements already around in the land of Germany, Austria, Switzerland. Each time they found, okay, this leads to an increase in open access publishing. Um, they also make sense. Why would you pay a subscription invoice for the reading part and then a multitude of APC invoices for the published part if you can just bundle that into one single invoice with a publisher? And surely this, if you bundle these, this will lead to saving us money potentially in discounts, but definitely also in our administration. 
whether you have a secretary having to deal with a multitude of small invoices or you just deal with one big invoice, surely we can save money this way. Um, surely it will also avoid what we typically called in the past double dipping is that the library pays for a subscription and the order pays for APC for the same content. Surely if you put it in one contact, that will sort that. Um, it's definitely user friendly for the researchers. I don't think I know of any researcher who says I'm against read and publish because they're no longer faced with an individual APC. They don't have individual bills anymore. So researchers are very happy with these. Um, they can be coupled with more transparency about costs. They typically are coupled with authors retaining copyright. And actually what is also handy, especially from the library perspective, from an administrative perspective, is they can be coupled with automated archiving of published versions in institutional repositories. We now live in the situation that quite a lot of funders demand that authors always deposit their published articles in a, the institutional repository. If these um, individual researchers, these authors have paid for a gold open access publication, they find it cumbersome and rightfully so, do I now also need to deposit extra in the institutional repository? Uh, quite a lot of libraries can sign, read and publish deals where they, this is an automated process that if an article is published with Springer or with Wiley or whatever, and it's paid for, then there's an automatic uh, deposit of that article in the institutional repository as well. But then the bad side. Uh, first, why read and publish deals are not enough. It is widely acknowledged that we don't get there completely if we just have funded mandates and open access deals with big publishers. Um, again, studies have shown you get about 70 to 75% of open access articles that way. If you want to achieve 100% of your articles, you're not going to get there with read and publish deals with the big publishers. Um, the problem is also, it does not cover all types of articles, a lot of read and publish deals. Not only do you have caps like you have yourself with one of Springer, that at some point you hit your maximum number, and also the small print quite often says, okay, this goes for research articles, but it doesn't count for reviews or it doesn't count for editorials. So if you want all types of articles, they're not always covered by read and publish. Typically they only cover corresponding authors. So if you're the second or third order, you need to be lucky that the corresponding order works at the institution with a read and publish deal. Otherwise that article will not go uh, be published in open access covered by a deal. Um, you can, of course, ask your question, and especially like uh, I'm in the arts and humanities, what about the other document types? What about chapters? What about books? What about conference proceedings? What about posters? Don't we want to open access for this kind of stuff as well? What about early versions, sharing preprints, working papers? What about even non-peer reviewed publications, like reports, publications in professional magazines, textbooks? Uh, if we want to have open access, we want to have open access for these things as well, not only for journal articles. And it doesn't solve the problem of the historical publications of the older previously published journal articles. Then another aspect of the bad, and that's actually why not why read and publish deals are not enough, why we potentially don't want them at all, is that they're not cost neutral and they're financially unsustainable in the long run. Um, cost neutral, typically that's like uh, what they're being yeah, how they are sold. Um, the problem is, of course, cost neutral for, on the publisher perspective is very different from cost neutral on the library perspective. A publisher says cost neutral is your subscription cost plus what you typically get from APCs from that institution. The sum of these two, that is cost neutral. From the library perspective is, yeah, but it's our subscription cost and that should stay the same. That is cost neutral. Um, and we see with read and publish deals, the same as we saw with our subscriptions, it's every year plus 2%, plus 5%, plus 7%. So where does this end? Um, second critique is, yeah, we have shifted the subscription budget of libraries through these deals, but what has actually changed in the business structure? Um, they read and publish deals strengthen the oligopoly, the big get bigger and stronger, the small are marginalized even more. And they are definitely inequitable in the sense that we just transpose an inability to read what we used to have in the past. Uh, scholars working at poor institutions or not being affiliated with an academic institution simply could not read scholarship because they could not afford the subscriptions. 
And now this is transposed exchange for an inability to publish. If they're working at a place which do not ha does not have a read and publish deal, they cannot publish for free in open access. Uh, they also tend to hoover up all library budgets, which means that they threaten funding for open access publishers who have never worked for the payroll business model. A read and publish deal is a good way of transforming what used to have a payment model to an, uh, an APC model, so to speak. But what about the open publishers who have never worked at a payment model? Um, what is also a critique is that we are actually making the profit-driven open access publishing model the most user-friendly. We're actually sort of gearing our researchers this way, do this. Um, while actually I attended a meeting a couple of years ago where somebody basically said like, we were making the worst kind of open access, the most user-friendly. Um, we're definitely also funding the further for-profit takeover of scholarly public communication. Like we can now complain a lot about vendor lock-in, about yeah, data repository services, about um, bibliographical software, about bibliometrics, but we're actually funding uh, the big technological companies through a read and publish deals to continue developing these things in the same way, in a vendor lock in way. Uh, and we're actually also undermining our own negotiation position next time around. And that's something that I worry about. In the past, we could say, look, the library budget is not sufficient to have a subscription to journal A or B. We need to cancel that subscription. And we could sort of explain that. Of course, this is a difficult message to bring. We can no longer afford this, but researchers understand this. Um, and they typically also have interlibrary loan solutions. Um, what we are being, going to be faced with in four or five years is the chance if they're like, for instance, for four or five years, they've been used for, I get to publish in open access for free with Wiley or with Springer or with whatever or that we have read and published with. And at some point we cannot afford this read and publish deal anymore. We need to go and explain to these researchers as a library, you no longer can publish in the journal you want. And this is a much more difficult story to bring message to bring than we no longer can afford a subscription. And so I'm definitely not alone. Some people are a bit uh, yeah, more radical than me, but the first one, Gamandi, is probably the most rhetorical. He calls transformative agreements, like uh, the publishing oligopoly has formed up a new monster. This is daylight robbery. This is librarian malpractice. These are very strong words. Um, Pooley, for instance, warns about like, yeah, we need to be very careful. We have an incumbent publisher spending lockdown. We're just basically transforming for-profit high subscription journals into for-profit high APC journals. Um, and so this will just hoover up all of the library budget. Um, Eve, multiple Eve said, yeah, ins inflating the subscription budget, that is not a transformation. Um, for instance, Eisenbach in Germany says, this is a mortal threat to smaller publishers. And he actually asked the question, this is not only unfair, but it's also illegal because you're driving other players out of the, of the market. Um, people in the global South will say, uh, this entrenches the marginalization of research voices from the global South. Um, and Fritz Farley for, uh, has said like, yeah, they don't eliminate the APCs, they just obfuscate them. They just, it's still a model based on APCs, we're just hiding them for the researchers. And so I would argue there is definitely a number of arrangements that deserve the name transform transformative, but in my view, deserve that name a lot more than the read and publish deals with legacy publishers. Um, and for instance, one of the possibilities is better use of green open access. You have in certain countries legislation which overrules publisher agreements to make green open access the norm after embargo period. You have that law in the Netherlands, you have that law in Belgium. You have solutions with green open access with the published first, green open access without embargo. Um, and the other element that I would say, or the other types of agreements that I would also definitely call transformative is that you have more and more possibilities to invest library budget into collective funding programs for nonprofit and community driven open access alternatives without auto facing charges. No. And just an example of the green open access agreements with publishers, we have one of those in Leuven with uh, Peter's Publishers, a small humanities publisher, uh, which basically since 2020, zero embargo green open access with the published version. And how did this happen? It's COVID hit, 
And it turned out we have a good papers publishers. We still have a not off campus license to access to their journals, which is of course a massive problem in Corona times. We contacted papers, they said, yes, but this is going to cost you a little bit more. We said, we understand this, but then we want to talk about open access. And so what we came to, uh, the agreement that we came to was, yes, we pay a bit more for off-campus uh, access than we used to have in the past, but now Kyleuven authors get a digital version, their published uh, version of their articles, get to put it in a repository and the published version becomes available immediately upon publication through the repository. For instance, for journals, you have collective funding, Open Library of Humanities, I think most of you know this, this is 28 called open access journals without author facing costs because it's a consortium of libraries that pay for the infrastructure. Liracis, so the big consortium in North America is starting this a little bit the same, has an open access community investment program, which helps journals, which are already diamond open access or who want to become diamond open access, to do this, to have a fundraising program and to have, they do basically, they communicate about the fundraising program and they do the financial administration for this. For books that exists, you for instance have open book publishers, you have Punctum Books, both of them publish books without author facing books, book processing charges because a consortium of libraries pays for it. Um, there's a library membership scheme for both of them. Uh, and for instance, what is now, I think in the last couple of months, this is now coming up. Um, another way of financing open access books is that publishers sell subscription access to their backlist of ebooks and or to a restricted font list. And with the profit they make this way, they invest it in publishing open access titles without author facing costs. And that is, for instance, the opening the future model, which is with Central European Press and with Liverpool University Press. MIT Press does it with Direct to Open, and you have the fun to mission of the University of Michigan Press. Um, I think that was very quickly what I had to say. So I just basically wanted to say like, yeah, transformative agreements is sometimes a, a confusing name. Not all transformative agreements, in my opinion, deserve the name transformative agreement. I would just, so just call them what they are namely read and publish deals or publish and read deals. Um, they're also very, very different. It's very uh, wrong, I think, to think, okay, a transformative agreement, it looks very different from publisher to publisher. A transformative agreement with Springer will be very different from the one that you have at Cogitatio, if you read the small print. Um, and so I find it actually confusing to label them all as transformative agreements. I, of course, get it, but it's something that we need to be aware of, of the library, well, from within the library, I think, is what are the small prints of the what, what is a small print of these agreements and always make sure that we safe keep part of our budget to do other things as well otherwise we're driving um or we're just uh putting forward one single model to achieve open access and in my personal opinion it's not necessarily the best model to achieve open access thank you Lotta, you are mute. I, I'm not muted now, am I? I was. No. Now it's fine, but, now it's fine. Yes, so uh, uh, you presented some uh, interesting alternatives, especially the green one, but I hope we will talk a little bit more at the end and discuss about that. Um, more information about library services can be found on our website and don't forget to follow our blog and social media channels to stay up to date with the latest news.